of the Church of the King Triumphant. The mystery of this great church scattered across the very loca various locations of North America, the seven continents of the world. Multitudes of them laying dormant in the still tides of death until resurrection morning. My what a spirit that I have felt here tonight in this place. And it is really my privilege to come and to see new faces that love the same king. Because our king is not just a man. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Hale, for the opportunity to come, District Superintendent. Brother Muncie thrilled my heart tonight with those words of exhortation, and I will be here to hear him. I couldn't help but look at that precious brother, and I wondered just how much has come and gone through those thought patterns that is forgotten if we could just pick up just a residue of it. Brother Elder, it's good to see you again. And all the brethren here of the Colorado District, the saints of God, it's such a nice crowd here tonight. I uh, really appreciate this privilege. It's an honor of ours to be here, my wife and I. And yet, I feel an awesome charge of the Spirit pressing us to some very definite directions in the Holy Ghost. I do not believe in a Christ that could have, that could have. I believe in an absolute Christ. He never could and never will fail. One of the most dangerous doctrines you can involve yourself in is the possibilities of the humanity of Jesus Christ. He was the eternal God of heaven. Never was his flesh subject to his deity or in control of his deity. But under all situations, his flesh had to circumvent and had to submit to that which ruled him, which was spirit being. No friend, no possibilities of sin. <laughs> Some time ago, young men Bible school came out with that old age-old question, could Jesus Christ have sinned? I said, don't even bring that discussion around my church. Don't even bring it around. We don't even want to discuss it. Because the mighty God never changes. And when Paul penned Hebrews 13 and 8, he was not talking about flesh, but he was talking about Jesus Christ as the eternal Savior, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're serving that God tonight. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you tonight. And everybody said, Praise the Lord. I 
hesitate to say this because I haven't come to do what I would like to do. You know, I... Sometimes my wife says, but honey, you forget that there is other types of sermons. My really... My real desire would be to preach that other type. But I've come tonight without a subject. I've just come with a little bit of the Word. And I believe you're going to help us expound it. And somewhere between now and daylight, we'll finish. Have your Bibles read with us the writings of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. Is this PA working? No, brother, it's plenty loud. I'm just kidding. We do not war after the flesh. Everybody said, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, I can't go any further till you get that down, okay? Though we walk in the flesh, 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 though we live in the flesh, though we exist in this temporal, you cannot war in this, in the kingdom of God. You may be seated. You see, in asking people questions so many times, if they really believe in the three-part makeup of man, and without hesitation, I get the same response almost every time that I ask it, even if I ask a minister. And they'll say, yes, we believe in that because we know that we are body, soul, and spirit. But the scripture does not say that. It never said that we're body, soul, and spirit. Paul rather says that we are spirit, soul, and body. But man has misconstrued so long the position of the apostolic church in her proper setting that all of the emphasis of life is placed upon the material man and the physical being that we know, you and I. I pray tonight that I will not uh, say anything that would be offensive or derogatory in any fashion. On the offset, let me say however your pastor believes, fantastic, stick with him. But I do want to share with you a little bit of God's Word. Hallelujah. And in a sense, this is a 
prayer and Bible conference. And this may be just a little bit more of Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. It appears, Paul says, that I come on so strong that I'm actually striking out against certain situations and issues and situations that develop in the local church body. But as that apostle set in the church for that particular dispensation of time to pin the epistles that you and I take and apply to our own spiritual growth and upbringing, he said, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. In other words, Paul, you're just simply a little personal. And you, you get involved physically in the, in the attack against some of us. But what he was wanting us to recognize is that in the kingdom of God, it cannot be referred to in the physical sense. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, when you live in a, con in a confinement that is relegated to emotionalism, to the basic five senses of the body, it's very difficult for us to comprehend in a spiritual application how it is that we cannot walk in the flesh and yet we have to live in this flesh. And we have to listen with this ear, see with these eyes, feel with these hands, and taste with these lips and tongue. And, and these senses that are in us are so evident and they seem to be so much a part of us. It's very difficult for us to comprehend what the man of God is actually saying. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Your battle, my friend, can never be fought in a mind over matter situation. Amen. And I certainly, certainly want you to recognize tonight that I believe in self-improvement. And I don't see a thing wrong with you studying a little bit of the basic nature of man. The psychological makeup of every one of us. I'm not opposed to that. But when it comes to spiritual living for God, it's not a matter of knowing how to put your thought patterns together physically. But it's a matter of discovery that though we are in this body, we do not fight our spiritual warfare in this body. Hallelujah. I said we don't fight it in this body because as much as you are physical, you are also a spirit being. I said you are a spirit being. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That is temporal. That is fleshly. One Translation says that is the unregenerate nature. It is that animate being. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They cannot be temporal. Our weapons cannot be physically something that you get a hold of, like me holding on to a microphone. That's why that we cannot deceive ourselves, predict the operations of the Spirit, in an apostolic church. Now you can to some degree say what's going to happen. But I promise you, if your church is really on fire in the spirit, there will be things happen in the course of one red hot apostolic revival that you will not be able to foresee or predict because it's not according to the physical intellect of any one of us. Hallelujah. Well, I may be able to predict that the choir is going to sing, or the preacher is going to preach, or Sister Susie is going to testify. But, friend, I, do, I want you to know that when the Holy Ghost really gets to moving in an apostolic church, there comes those extras into service. 
Hallelujah. Some of the best things I have ever seen in our local assembly was after we dismissed and said you can go on home. And then like a wave cloud of supernatural glory, it comes thundering through and says, wait a minute, I want to do another work here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. They're not carnal. But they are mighty through May I substitute there? They are mighty through the Spirit, God and Spirit being the self-same, to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. You see, when you discover, brother, how strong that muscle is, how much it can do, and you recognize after equating what's got to be done and you figure out how limited you are. Right. You say, hey, I'm not going to be able to do it with this physical man. I've got some things that need to be solved that I can't solve. You want to know why that we're eat up with worry and frustration? You want to know why that you get discouraged? You want to know why you get down in spiritual depths and wonder if God's going to do anything in these last days? Listen, if anybody tells you that there won't be a great apostolic church in the last day, you forget them. I want you to know that the stage is getting set for the day, the greatest display of the supernatural of God that this world has ever witnessed. He made his appearing into a world that was eaten up with religious tradition. He came in an hour when men in their legalism dotted the I and crossed the T according to the Sadduceical and Pharisaical traditions. He broke every precedent. He came against their wishes and will and manifested himself in spite of them. He couldn't be the king. He was a Nazarite. He was the son of Joseph the carpenter. He was lowly and an outcast. He couldn't be Messiah. And I want you to know the world is saying they can't be the true church. They don't have the credentials. Many of them came from the very simple and ordinary walks of life. They've come from across the tracks. They've come from the very dives of iniquity. They have come from the very depths of degradation and sin. That can't be a church. They have to be some kind of an occult. They have to be some type of heresy. But what they do not know is that we... I said we have discovered him hallelujah not only have we discovered him we've discovered his power we've discovered his character we have discovered his person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. Through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds. Cast, you say, but Brother McLean, why don't you preach something we haven't heard? I know you've heard this in Bible study after Bible study, but it's good to hear it again, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Casting down. Casting down. Casting down. You don't mind me using you a little bit, do you, brother? Casting down imaginations. Getting in your mind, brother. Hallelujah. You come to church and you got a few doubts. 
you're hung up on some worries. You've got it all figured out your way. You've got it figured out mathematically, physically. It looks like if so and so doesn't happen, this is going to happen. If we don't have one man get the Holy Ghost or three people pray through, or if somebody doesn't do something, the lights can't keep burning. We are dealing with impossible situations. I want you to know that we are serving one tonight that can cast down imagination. Hallelujah! me stop and say this. Paul didn't say that your weapons and your warfare couldn't be carnal. You do have a choice. You can be carnal minded. You can find it with your own intellect. You can figure it out mathematically. And you can work out your own strategy. And when you get to the end of your physical limitation, that's where you collapse. You add it all up, and it doesn't add up. When your budget in the budget won't work, when you size it all up and it can't be sized up, then you're in, the, you're in this thing backwards. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Casting down imaginations. I want you to know we can have a revival right there on that one verse of scripture. If I could just take the time tonight to go through this crowd and lay hands on everybody and get rid of a lot of thinking. <laughs> My wife's nephew goes to our church. Some time ago he was laid off of his work. That young man is a faithful young man to our assembly. I mean, he comes and he gives and he sacrifices. It's not paying your tithes and giving offerings. The fellow's right there. He does it all. And I tell you how I feel about this thing. When God says do something, do it. We had a prayer meeting for men out of work and we prayed for him also. The spirit of prophecy came on us and I prophesied over him. He has a history of high blood pressure. You know, it runs in the family. Everybody has high blood pressure. Not overweight, just part of the family situation. You know, when you, when you follow the Spirit, you don't know everything that's in the meal that's working. Well, I didn't know that he had talked to one of the men in the church that knew, knew a little connection there about a job opportunity. He came to me and he said, Brother McLean, I need prayer. I said, why? He said, well, I'm going to take my physical. I'm, and I, it's possible I'm going to get on with Otis Elevator. And uh, it's a good job. And I really want the job. But I want you to pray, pray for my blood pressure that it will go down. And I just started to get the bottle of oil and the Holy Ghost stopped me. I said, no. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm not going to pray for you. He said, Why? I said, the Lord spoke and said that he was taking care of you and there was nothing for you to worry about. I said, forget your blood pressure. <laughs> 300 men were trying to get the job. They took his blood pressure five times and still hired him in spite of five times it was high. He said, Brother McLean, why didn't the Lord just heal him? Because he could not have recognized that there is a God who knows how to get beyond ever impossibility. He come to me, he said, Brother McLean, do you realize I knew other young men that had their blood pressure checked and they wouldn't even talk to them the second time. 
Oh, help us, Jesus. I'm telling you tonight, if you're trying to figure it out, you're doing it wrong. You're going to have to get into another dimension. And it's called the work of the Spirit. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. It doesn't matter where it comes from, who it is, what the circumstance, what the situation. Bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, every thought. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I've been around Pentecost enough. I know how it is and I've got it all figured out. You've got your version of Pentecost figured out. I personally believe there is some chapters of the church that haven't been written yet. You say, but Bill McLean, things are getting less and less. There is a crying desire in the ranks of the church for the supernatural. My personal observation is we're going to see it. We're going to see it. Somebody said, let's get a miracle out of every church and compile it and look at those miracles. Friend, there is within the very bosom of the church when she starts looking through spiritual eyes, there is a revival of supernatural that we won't be able to put down on paper because it'll be of such magnitude. He is preparing a revival in the last day. I believe the revival of the last day will be paradoxical. I, in, in, in saying that, I believe that on one side of a street, it can happen. People can be healed. On the opposite side, the blindness of carnality will not allow them to know what's happening just a few feet away. Men in the time of Christ brushed by him never knew him to be the God of eternity never knew that resident power that was within the confines of his humanity no they never knew it but oh friend it did not change the fact that he was God manifested in the flesh and I may have a physical tying to this natural world that carries me back into the foothills of East Texas. But I want you to know there's something far more different than that because there is a spiritual genealogical record that ties me in with the blood lineage of the only begotten of the Father. And you tonight also have a blood lineage. We have touched his righteousness. We have touched his blood. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that this congregation cannot do when they put themselves to believing in the throes of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody said hallelujah. Are you still with me? Everybody said, I love you, Jesus. Everybody said, I love you, Jesus. Praise God. I'll wade off into some waters that could be tested. I do not believe that Jesus Christ was ever being tested as to whether or not he was weak or he was strong. Most of his temptation came from the same spirit that had been with that spirit that was resident in him in the heavenlies. Satan exalted himself and tried to usurp an authority against God in the high and lofty place of the eternals was cast out of heaven one third of the angels with him 
his arrogance and his pride never changed. And when God Almighty came to this earth, that same spirit, that same angel, attacked the same God in the same fashion he did in the heavenlies. Don't you think, don't you know that he knew who he was? That's why he knew he could turn stones into bread. That's why he knew he could cast himself down. He knew that Jesus knew that he was the ruler and the prince and the power of this atmosphere because he was cast down into this atmosphere. No, the devil knew all of that. But he also recognized the eternal nature that was, was resident in that man. Somebody said, what if, what if? There was no what ifs. When Jesus said, it is written. Huh. That old spirit had to shake because he said, wait a minute. The eternal voice of eternity is talking now. When he said, it is written. Thou shalt not tempt. Who? The Lord thy God. Lucifer, I'm your God. You may not recognize me, but I'm your creator. I don't want you to get confused tonight, but... Lucifer had to remember that's the one that made me. He had to recognize that the created is always subject to the creator. And I cast you down into this atmosphere. But if you think I'm going to let you come and by subtlety and begonment deceive my creation and allow you to destroy them without choice you've got another thought coming devil I'm telling you I wish I could just preach what I'm feeling inside he came determined to set before the world an open door into the heavenlies that no man could shut. It doesn't matter what prophet says, it's over. It doesn't matter what interpretation says, it, there's nothing else that can be. It doesn't matter what ideology or what theology may come from the minds and the confines of men. God Almighty said, I'm going to set an open door. Nobody's going to shut it. I'm going to purchase redemption with my sonship and with my own blood that is, in, that is in that sonship. You see, Luke tells us in the writings of Acts that the blood that was shed was the blood of God. Romans 8 and 1. Let's go a little further. I'm going to have to hurry if I get halfway through. There is therefore now oh I like that active sense there is therefore now one time there was one time I was bound one time I was in bondage one time I couldn't help myself one time I couldn't resist temptation one time I couldn't say no I just had to yield to every spirit to every whelm to every temptation and desire but oh there is now there is now something has happened to us something has happened to us no condemnation no condemnation to them 
which are in Christ. May I explain why? There's some days it's good. Some days are bad. Huh? Some days I'm in my coat. Some days I'm out of my coat. Fairly simple, huh? Some of your days you wake up in the flesh. And you live all day long in the flesh. Oh, but I thought if you got the Holy Ghost, you always had the Holy Ghost and you never had any problems. I don't know who taught you that. May I deviate a little bit from the scriptural pattern I had laid out? You see, people get to talking about, oh, that Apostle Paul, he, you know, he had it all together. And in that discourse, he went down the line. Peril, troubles, heartaches, angels, pressures, beatings, left for dead, imprisoned, shipwrecked, principalities, powers. He said, nothing can separate me. Nothing can separate me from what? Love of God. Now let me show you the contrast to the same man talking. That same man said in, the, in his letter to the Romans, he said, I find in my members another law. There's a struggle going on. And the things I would do, I do not. You ever wake up going to do right and do wrong? Could I just get down to where you live? You go on a three-day fast, go up to church and pray an hour, and I mean get red hot and go home and chew your wife out. Huh? I don't understand. Man, I was in the spirit last night at church. I felt the Holy Ghost. Let me show you how fickle human nature is. You can fill your stomach till you do not want one more bite of anything. They can hold out the most delicious looking piece of pie. And wouldn't you have, I can't, I can't, I'm full. And it's not four hours later, you could eat the whole pie, not a piece of it. That's human nature. Somebody said, well, if you get the kind of Holy Ghost I got, it'd be the lasting kind. Now, may I qualify this statement? I do realize that there is a lot of shallow experiences being passed out. Huh? A lot of real shallow experiences being passed out. But I also realize that we are in the final stages of testing and everything that can be shaken will be shaken in this age. There is more iniquity. And the greater the iniquity, the greater the spirit to combat the iniquity. The worse humanity becomes, the greater necessity for the working of the supernatural of the spirit. We are entering an age where the war between the flesh and the spirit is going to be manifested. We're seeing it already. People are apostatizing. They are apostatizing. They're falling after men's religion and idea. That doesn't change truth one iota. Do you know what Paul discovered? He said, it's not going to be angels that's going to cause me any problems. It's not going to be water. It's not going to be ships. It's not going to be adversities as most people know them. But there's one situation that I am deeply concerned about. That's Paul. He said, I fear after that I preach to others that I, the personal pronoun, I become a castaway. The inference, not that Brother Johnson does it. Not that Brother Muncie does it. Or Brother Hell does something that would offend me. No. He said, my worry and frustration is if I can keep under my own body subjections. Paul 
came up with one key principle of physical subjection and that is he said I will die daily the amplified version doesn't say that he would become a castaway but he said I beat my body black and blue lest that I would be thrown away or cast out Now that I'm going to meddle a little bit, and some of us, including myself, could find justification in this. When Paul said bodily exercise profited little, he was not referring to the advantages of longevity. Or to the disadvantages of longevity. You know what he's talking about? He said, you can, you can exercise and take care of your physical man and you may add 10 years to your life, but that's not what profits. Whether you live from this day 10 years longer or less, we see that in the pattern of Hezekiah. He said, what you need to discover is spiritual exercise. Sure, scientifically, we, it's a proven fact that it's good for you and I to know what a diet is. I'm really talking, huh? But no, I can't stick my head in the sand and say, well, I don't have to do anything. Bless God, we're the only people in the world that can eat. That isn't what he said. What he's talking about is a spiritual insight. It's a spiritual insight. It's getting lost in the spirit realm. It's forgetting that the lights are on. It's forgetting what time it is. It's forgetting whether I preached an hour or two hours or three hours. It's getting lost in the Holy Ghost that's important. Let me go back to that verse in Romans 8. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, but walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Very simple. If you are physically minded, you do physical things. That's the Mary Martha religion, right? You ever heard of that? Some of the most hard to explain situations around a church. Let me offer this to you pastors. You've got a man that he'll, he'll, he'll be your janitor. He'll park your cars. He'll come up and do all of those menial tasks that nobody else will do because there is an in, there's a balance that has to be in every church. Can I just be practical tonight? You know, some people are so spiritually wonderful that they can never bend over and pick up a piece of paper in the church. I'm sorry, Brother Pastor, but I'm on a fast. I, I'm, I'm a little weak. I, I can't come out to the church car wash raising a little money for shoes for Christ. I, I, I'm on a fast. I'm weak. I, I'm going up in the mountains to pray today. I've met up with some of those hypocrites. Now let me offer the other side. One of the biggest problems a pastor's ever faced is to get a man that'll work his head off, but he won't pray a gnat's breath. I've got some good ones. Come time to work? Yes! They'll be here any time to work. It doesn't matter what it is. Take off your coat, and I mean let the perspiration roll. We're going to work for Jesus. I can call a 10 o'clock prayer meeting, and they're tired. They won't show up. Oh, wouldn't you like to be a pastor? Some of you pastors know what I'm talking about, huh? After the Spirit. But they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. They're spiritually minded. I'm going to offer to you something. When it comes to coming to church, you do not have to feel God. to have church. Somebody said, when the Spirit gets moving, I'm going to get into it. Show that to me in the Bible. 
When you come to church, I know I'm getting off on the strange lines here, and Brother Pastor, you have to bring it back into confines when it gets out of hand, because people can get awful carnal and do some things. Like recently, I had to stop all my little fellows from running. I said, praise God, hallelujah, if you're not 12 years old, you can't run around the church. I said, who said? I said. And since I'm the pastor, I run the show. I said, now, if you want to run, you, we got a little more room up the front. I said, you can run around one of those altars a time or two. Well, some of them little guys just run because everybody else is running, you know, like it's a track meet. to do to worship is be honest and sincere. Have you ever eaten when you wasn't hungry? How many a time have I sat down and said, I'm not hungry? And my wife would look at me and later on and say, I'm glad you wasn't. There wouldn't have been enough. You get into it, and the flavor of the food creates an appetite. Now, you, you say, Bill McLean, you're going to spread a little heresy. Remember one thing. All you pastors go back home and keep preaching just like you always have. But I don't have to feel nothing to shout. Hey, if I can raise my voice at will, I can raise it at will to worship. You've just got to have the right motive and the right spirit and be subject to the ruler, which is your under-shepherd, your pastor, in your local assembly. One of the, great, the greater downfalls of apostolic worship is that we wait until the thunder comes. And if a church ever gets in a dry spell, they backslide because they don't know how to worship God. Worship, if you lift your hands and wave them and mean it, it's honest before God. If you jump up and down and mean it, it's honest before God. Now here's the catch to it all. If you'll start out sincere, it won't be long until you will feel something. Because the good book says that he inhabits the praises. Just try a little bit. Dry style. Don't feel nothing. Just say you love him a little bit and watch him come right into your expression. Clap your hands a little bit and you start out feeling nothing. But in a while, you're going to feel more than a hand clap. You're going to feel more than a foot stomp. You're going to feel more than a shaking. You're going to feel the presence of the invisible God of glory. That's good enough. The Brother McLean, I don't like that. You've got to learn to get up and sit down, operate under the Spirit, whether it's the pastor or the evangelist. He said in the church certain offices and ministries. Now here's something I want to dwell with. I feel an impact of the Spirit along this line. 
if we're not careful, we'll get certain spiritual bodies in the congregation. And if they don't shout, everybody else is out of spirit. I tell you, the one person to watch, watch the pastor. Get your eyes on the pastor's wife. And she may not be the shouting kind. My wife doesn't shout. Oh, she's one of them. I do not contend or believe you have to do any particular thing to worship God. You can weep and worship Him. You can pat your hands and worship Him. You can be loud and worshiping. You can run the aisles and worship Him. You may even get to where you want to roll on the floor and worship Him. I'm not opposed to holy rolling. But I want to tell you something. We have created too many stigmatisms in our churches. And if one spiritual body doesn't do something, recently, some time ago, I was in a certain place preaching and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I told the pastor later, I said, there's a young man here that's assisting and working with you that he is really wanting to get his hands in here. Yeah. Mm. Hallelujah. I want you to know when it comes time to worship, if nobody else is doing anything and you feel like praising God, praise Him. Here's how I teach it and believe it. If you get out of order, I am not personally going to offend you if you'll be reasonable with me. I'll catch you after church and say, hey, the last lap wasn't necessary. Didn't you jump a few jumps too much tonight? <laughs> Come on. You don't have to embarrass them. And they'll get the confidence of you. And they'll learn to follow spiritual direction and worship well so much for that I felt like saying it <clears throat> it's the will of the Holy Ghost for some of you to get your eyes back on the preacher and not a little spiritual entity in the pew hallelujah I felt that strong alright verse 6 or to be carnal minded is death. Watch death. Oh, I got carnal didn't die. Yes, you did. He wasn't talking about a literal death after the flesh. He's talking about a spiritual death after the spirit. I've had people come to me and say, oh, I heard this and that and, and uh, I got out of the church and going to do this and going to do that. Nothing happened. I'm doing fine. No, you're spiritually dead. You don't know it. All right. To be carnally minded is, 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 is death. To be spiritually minded is life. Life. Everybody said life. And tranquilizers. I'm telling you, honey, when you get the Holy Ghost and really start praying, He'll put your emotions in order. He'll make you lay down at night and sleep like a baby. And if you get to where you can't rest, I'm not saying there's not exceptions to the rule. You can eat too much and not sleep good, you know. <laughs> no big spiritual problem. <laughs> you can adjust that the next day. Everybody's going to have a bad night occasionally. I'm not talking about that. But I'm here, I'm here to tell you, when it gets to where you can't have peace of mind and tranquility, all you need to do is take a visit to the church house, get on your face, and have a good praying through. You'll go home and have, you will have a spiritual inoculation. And you'll lay all your troubles down, and the devil will say, don't you know about this problem, that problem? <laughs> You know, there's nothing any more sweeter and beautiful than saints. And they get to thinking that sometimes all the pastor does is lay around and cry and moan in the spirit. Oh, hey, I want to tell you something. I just love to have a good praying through and lay every problem down, go to sleep, and let the devil worry about it. You 
You say, you're not concerned. I'm going to tell you something. When you get an insight in the Spirit and you see it through the eye of the Holy Ghost, it'll be just like you saw it. It will come to pass. Hallelujah. I don't know how the time is. I, I, I've got a half of my first page. I've got two more to go. This is not notes. This is scripture. I've got my glasses. I'd rather read it typed than I can read it without having to put the glasses on. The carnal mind is in me with God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. It's enmity. It's alien. It can't perceive. It doesn't understand. And it can't. When you get a rotten attitude, a hold to you, it doesn't do you any good to get the book and read it. That's why people get discouraged reading the Bible. I just don't understand it. I can't read it. And I try to read it. And I just can't get an insight. You know what's wrong with you? You've got spiritual problems. You need a praying through. You're so carnal, you stink. Rigor mortis is already set up in you. You're, you're going the road of death. No, friend, you know why you can't comprehend it? You're not in a spiritual perception. It's alien. It's enmity. God can't tolerate your carnality. He won't put up with it one iota. It doesn't matter how long you've been preaching. It doesn't matter how long you've been shouting. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church in that local assembly. When you get carnal minded, God says, I'm moving out. But I tell you what, I've watched it in my life. There's, hey, there's nothing short of being honest, is there? Do you think in my 44 years I've always enjoyed reading the Bible? <laughs> Just loved every minute of it. I'd be lying if I told you that. Oh, oh. You know, sometimes people can't even realize that I'm, that I'm just a man too. Yes, I have woke up in my carnalities. I didn't want to see the book. I didn't want to touch the book. But it was a sure sign that I need a good praying through. Sure sign that I've got spiritual problems. Maybe not something that I've committed, but it's something that I've omitted out of my life. And I've got to go back and have a renewing in the Holy Ghost. And when you get it, it all gets all fresh again. And I want you to know, there's absolutely nothing any more beautiful than to get into a place of contrition and prayer and pick up the Holy Writ and begin to weep over the beautiful Word of God. It's so edifying. It's so strength-building. All of those fears and frustrations that are outside of the spiritual mind they're gone and that spiritual person comes to life and you see things through the eyes of the Holy Ghost you see backsliders praying through you see churches being edified and glorified with an old time revival of the Holy Ghost verse 8 so then they that are in the flesh cannot Everybody said it. Yeah. Cannot. Cannot. Please God. Right. Hey, I, I want you to know I think you're some wonderful people. I'm preaching like you're just a bunch of nobodies. Really, you're some good people. You've got to be good to sit there and listen to me like this. I said all that so I could give you another good hard punch. <laughs> Some of you darlings come in, you're so tired and say, hey, if that preacher had to work like I work, you know, and put in the arms I put in. Hey, that's right. That's right. I agree with that. Because I've been where you're at. I know what it is to get up at five in the morning and work all day long. I know what it is for every bone in your body to ache and you come staggering through the church and here comes that young evangelist got to sleep to nine you know and pray a little bit and get ready for church hallelujah no wonder he's hanging off of the light fixtures <laughs> 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 
and you're sitting there just in you got a case of oh me's poor me let me tell you something what we have got to get out of in our in this age and day you've got to work but that's only temporal the house you buy the car you drive the clothes you wear all of it's temporal and you've got to do that it's just like your employer says and we live in a time when you have eco economic pressures now and, and, and when jobs get scarce you can just miss a job and somebody will take your place I mean they'll lay you off right quick because you're not right there all the time punctual there it comes and if this is necessary for you to make your 300, 400, 200 whatever you make to get by on then we've got to understand it's also compulsory in the spirit world that we punch in you don't punch in because you feel good you don't punch in because you feel anything maybe I'm I must be all by myself all of you must go to work feeling wonderful every morning when I was going to work some mornings I did feel good but there's a lot of mornings I wanted to put my head under the pillow and push the sun completely back on the other side of the earth and say hey it's not 6.30 <laughs> it's 1 o'clock at night and I've got a lot of sleeping to do what I want you to know is simply this if it's time to get up you gotta get up if it's time to go to work you gotta go to work and when you walk through the church door don't come in here I'm tired I've worked 12 hours I've done more work than four of you other little old flimsy puny people around here and you start going around and yeah, I'm reading your mind huh you're looking over there yeah he works in the office he's not out there having to do hard physical work on a construction job yeah well, no wonder he can shout he hadn't worked like I've worked no you've missed it all together God's not judging whether he put in 40 hours physical or 30 minutes physical God's judging him by one thing he's worshiping me his creator and don't you think that God is not going to respond to tired hands and a weary body he knows you from head to foot and he knows when you lift up that weary hand and say I love you Jesus he knew it took every ounce of energy you could get to do it and if you feel like Moses warring against the Canaanites get somebody to hold your hands up a few minutes because after a while he's going to touch me and I'm going to feel the wave of his glory cloud Praise God. We are debtors not to the flesh. Romans 8 and 12. To live after the flesh. But we, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. How do you mortify the deeds of the body? Bless God, I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to. I know the Bible says, shun the very appearance of evil. If you hadn't flipped over into the writings of Philippians lately, read through there in the fourth chapter. See those things you're supposed to get away from, stay away from. Huh? The Bible says there, shun the very appearance of evil. The very appearance of it. Get away from it. I just don't know why I've been tempted. I can tell you why you've been tempted. It's where you're living. You're living right on the corner of Temptation Street. Your eyes are crossing regular. Your mind is heated up with sensuality in human depravity and you come wondering why God is where he's at. Shun the very appearance of it. But I'm going to tell you something else. The shunning is the one requirement you have to do. But just because you shun it, it won't give you a guarantee of not being tempted to yield to your physical degradation and nature. That's why that right in the confines of our congregations, we have some of the most embarrassing situations to arise. Getting quiet, isn't it? How did he say you're going to handle the flesh? You're going to have to mortify the flesh. Bless God, I'm going to kill the flesh. I'm going to go to a 40-day flesh. Uh, fast, uh, 
40 day what? Flesh. <laughs> 40 day fast and kill the flesh. No! You can't, you cannot kill your humanity just by fasting. Because once you start back eating, the old man comes back and says, Hello, I'm back. I've had more, for the month of you, you could tell this much better than I could. I've had more young men say, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast till I get on top of everything. I said, son, you've got another thought coming. There's not much room at the top of the mountain. And when you get up there, you're going to have to go back down. But you know where Jesus is? He's not just on the mountain. He's in the valley. The most beautiful passage we have Perhaps in the Bible, the 23rd Psalm is in the valley. But how are you going to handle it? You're going to mortify the flesh in the spirit. So come in tired. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. My muscles may hurt. I may be physically out of it. My mind may be almost asleep, but I'm going to love you anyway. And by doing so, you're mortifying. You're taking care of a nature that's resident within you that will not be gotten rid of until your corrupt body is changed. It'll spring back on you just like spring grass in the springtime. Your nature will come right back. Your nature will come right back. But I thought there was a place in God. There is. But the Spirit is the mortifier. You're not the mortifier. When Paul put his body under subjection, he is talking about, I am coming under the auspices, under the jurisdiction, under the principal care of the Spirit of the living God. I'm being subject to Him. That I say to him, you do the work. It's like the surgeon. He will not touch you until you give him the authority to s offer surgery to your body. And there is no point of recourse. The Holy Ghost will not touch you. It will not touch me until I give him complete control of my life. Then he'll come in and start his operation. He will bring about mortification. He'll take out stony things. He'll take out attitudes. He'll take out bitternesses. He'll take out unforgiving spirits. He'll change our thinking. He'll turn us all around. He'll cause the brazen to weep and to cry. He'll cause the quiet to shout. He'll cause the boastful and the proud to humble themselves in tears. The Spirit will do His work. Galatians 5.25 If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 2 and 1 And you hath He quickened, who were dead in the trespasses of sin, were in times past. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air. The prince, the powers of the air. Every time we breathe in, we're breathing in into a spirit world. You can believe it or not, we're breathing in a spirit world. Right now in this building, there is every kind of filth bouncing around in this building by the powers of the television wavelengths. And if you can get on the right frequency, you can get into every kind of story, every time of type of soap opera. You can see every kind of insinuation. You can see all kinds of immorality if you can tap into the wavelength of it. If that's possible, by man's ingenuity, in the spirit realm, we're breathing in. You can contact spirits. That's why you can be living for God and do beautifully for weeks and months and days. And suddenly, as if somebody hits somebody behind the head, a man that's lived for God goes out and does some of the most hideous and horrible things. He said, I don't understand it. Never thought that would happen to that preacher. Never thought it would happen to that brother. Never thought it would happen to that saint. You want to know why? Because we're breathing in a spirit world. We're living in a spiritual world. And we're going to have to operate in a spiritual dimension. I hope I'm not coming on too heavy tonight. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Yes. 
Yeah, you can entertain something just for a while, son. And before long, you'll be involved in that same entertainment. Oh, God, I feel some heavy spirits here tonight. There is on the guise of your beautiful faces problems resident in some of you because you are not living an overcoming spiritual life. I am not saying anything derogatory or hard against you. You've got to circum circumvent. You've got to give in to God. You're going to have to say yes. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Ghost that is within you. What are you talking about grieving it? You are, you are subject to it. It is not subject to you. He is to be the rectifier of your life. You're not to be the one that would control it. Amongst whom, verse 3, whom also we have all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The flesh and the mind. We fulfill those desires. We, want, we thought about it. We meditated. We lived. And oh, we got ourselves all hallucinated up in our own concepts and our own ideas. And we gave in to those frustrations. Getting quiet, isn't it? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Just like other people. There's not one iota of difference in us, even though we have the part of outward wholeness than the world if we don't have inward wholeness. Huh? Some of us say, well, if it's not in the heart, you don't need it out. No, friend. I want to tell you one of the biggest lies the devil has ever hatched up is saying it's all in the heart, it's all in the heart, it's all in the heart. You know why the devil says that? Because he knows that only God can read the heart. Do you hear me? Only God can read the heart. None of you are smart enough to read the heart. You say, I can discern, you cannot discern. Only the Spirit can discern. And if you happen to discern, it was not you, it was the Spirit in you that discerned. Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh at the heart. So it's important if we are going to be Christ-like, we're going to have to take on certain physical attributes that will reveal a Christ-like nature so you can know what I am and I can know what you are. Don't you ever swallow the idea in the charismatic world, and there's some good charismatics that have sincerely got the Holy Ghost, but they need a baptism of holiness. My Bible said without holiness, no man shall see him. And there are some prerequisites of wholeness that are important. I told you I didn't have a subject. It's evident, isn't it? I'm going from one side to the other, but let me just touch on it. I feel like just saying this. Do you know that there is no place in the Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament, that God ever changed His views on an abomination? Anything that was abominable has always been abominable and always shall be abominable. And He set down the order with Moses. That a woman could not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Neither can a man wear that which pertaineth to a woman. It is an abomination in the sight of God. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter whether it's a UPC or whatever other organization that comes by and says, we can change things. They can not be changed. There has to be a standard of holiness and identification in the church separating the male from the female. The Lord God wouldn't even allow them to mix materials. He wouldn't allow various beasts to plow beside each other. He wouldn't even allow the mixing of seed to be planted he wanted there to be a distinct identification in every physical created being that he ever made. Whether it be a human being, whether it be a plant, whether it be an animal, he wanted there to be a clear identification. And I want you to know men are to look like men and women are to look like women. And they're to dress like a woman and a man's to dress like a man. Hey, that's free. That's not even in my notes. 
Everybody said hallelujah. What time is it? We don't care. I do. It's 10 after 10. I've been up here 10 minutes, right? <laughs> hallelujah. I don't know how much more. Galatians 2 and 20. I'm going to stop shortly. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. It is an amazing thing to me that the average person does not understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, I understand it. No, you don't. I'm crucified with Christ. You know why Jesus Christ did not place any physical concern upon his body? Because the spirit that was resident in his body had declared to him that if, you, if they destroy this temple three days, it will be raised up. He said, I'm going to raise it up. Was the man going to raise it up? No. The spirit within him was going to raise it back to life. The body didn't have power over the spirit, but the spirit had power over the body. Man has reversed it. Man's got power over his spirit. But God, the spirit, had power over his body. His body being his sonship. He dwelt in that body. I will raise it up. I want you to know that friend of mine, it has not stopped. It is not over. When a saint of God dies, they have only begun to live. I pray God help us. Honey, you're sitting here and hearing it. I pray God when it comes time for me to die that there's not a whole lot of weeping. He said, Brother McLean, you don't know, what are you saying? I want you to know for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. There is something beyond the grave. There is a resurrection hope. And if you think you've lived and had some church here, you wait till we get to millennial morning. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. When we put off corruptible and put on incorruptible. And when the Lord God eternal comes back and we see him as he is, and we know him as he is, for we shall be like him. There's a day coming for the church that is beyond imagination. We cannot even begin to comprehend what is in store for them who keep themselves unto the people of Jesus Christ I'm crucified with Christ Christ willed his body to death we will our flesh into subjection nevertheless not I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We didn't get this because we deserved it. We got it out of unmerited, unqualified grace. I have no right to raise my hands outside of the mercies of Jesus Christ. I have no right to His graces and His forgiveness and His eternal salvation outside of His unmerited graces. But by grace, He brought it to me that I by faith could believe and trust in Him and have life more abundantly. There's a great day coming for the church. I'm stopping, not because I'm finished. I haven't even gone halfway through these scriptures. The Almighty God is going to do exploits in these hours. There is a revival of the unbelievable, unusual coming in this age. Could I talk to you just for a second as we close? There is a people that love His appearing, that love His return. Somebody said, I want to see Jesus, I want Him to come back. You cannot say that consistently and mean it if you don't sit together regular in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Don't tell Him you want Him to come back. 
just at church. Don't get emotionally worked up. Your eyes moistened with tears, weep and cry and tell the church how much you love God when you hadn't walked in those precious promises of His and escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust and enter into that spirit realm where you don't know the time of the day or the month of the week but you're just with Christ. Jesus, I surrender my everything to You. I surrender it all to You. Oh no! You're a beautiful people. You took pains to get ready to come. I appreciate that. There is a definite, absolute place for physical hygiene in every one of our lives. And cleanliness is a very attribute of the church. But as much as you prepared your body physically, so must we prepare ourselves spiritually. Awaiting for His presence. Jesus, I surrender my all to You. I feel like offering a very strange close to this service. There's a man here that wants deliverance. I charge you to come to Jesus and let Him deliver you. There is someone here very desperately disgusted and frustrated in self. I challenge you to try my Jesus. Sir, you tried to start and stop on your own. It just doesn't work. But you let Jesus help you. He'll change you. You're here tonight. Your life's a mixed up, confused, frustrated, darkened path. But the light of eternity wants to shine bright into your heart tonight if you'll let Him. But preacher, I've tried before. That's just the problem. Come to the King Physician and let Him do heart surgery tonight on you. And He will. As the audience stands. Wendell Cochran stood the other night in our church. He said, you'll never know, church, how it is to remember where you come from. He said, just a few years ago, I awakened one morning in my own front yard, totally undressed. Somebody had been kind enough to hide the embarrassment of my nudity with a blanket. I don't know what I'd been doing or where I'd been. High on drugs and high on alcohol. He came in a long-haired, hippie-looking man, his wife filing for divorce, said she's through with a man that was so mixed up. But he said, folks, when he got through with me, he said, I can honestly say I've never wanted to taste another drink of liquor. I've never wanted another night on the world. I've never wanted another cigarette. I wake up with my right mind in the morning. I've got my family. I've got my wife that was going to leave me. We're all in the church. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Weary saint of God, quit trying to figure it out. Find a closet and tell Jesus. Discouraged pastor, quit trying to add it up. It won't add up. Get on your knees and tell Jesus. Casting your cares upon Him, He cares for you. Sir, I'm talking to you. I wouldn't embarrass you for nothing. Jesus wants to do a work in your life tonight. Come to Jesus now. I know the hour's late, but I feel a compelling of the Spirit that says, come on, let me do something.
something special in your heart. Urahaya, sarlara ba raba sara ma raba sata madaya. But oh no, not tonight. Tonight he calls. The bidding of the Holy Ghost is reaching to somebody. I feel a flowing of revival power. I feel a transformation of the spirit here. I feel deliverance for a soul. Whoever you are, don't be embarrassed. We're not here tonight to make fun or to make mockery. We're here to be strengthened by the powers of Christ Jesus. We're here to be edified by the Holy Ghost. We're here to be delivered by His witness and by His anointing. Wherever you're at, come join us. Whoever you are, surrender to His witness. upon the name of Jesus saints of God let's lift our hands in his presence hallelujah hallelujah they're still coming would you like to come how about it pastor you like to come and pray how about it pastor's wife how about it saint of God why don't we come as close as we can down around the front I know the hour's late but we need to get lost in the Holy Ghost we need to pray would you come come on let's come